One on one with David Shulkin. I sit down with the Secretary for Veterans Affairs to talk about changes he's making to the beleaguered agency. DACA on the docket. President Trump meets with GOP senators to discuss immigration. We're at the White House. The Federal Emergency Management Agency gives a green light to churches. We'll tell you how. Plus, chocoholics take note. Scientists have a dire warning for cocoa drinkers and candy lovers alike. On EWTM News Nightly for Thursday, January 4th, 2018. Good evening from Washington, D.C., and thank you to those of you joining us from around the world for news from a Catholic perspective. I'm Lauren Ashburn. Veterans Affairs is the second largest federal agency, and it has been plagued with major problems and scandals for years. In 2014, then-VA Secretary Eric Shinseki resigned after stories emerged about long wait lines at VA centers, resulting in delayed treatment and, in some cases, death. More recently, a bipartisan group of senators called for an investigation into the agency, which serves 9 million military veterans each year. Joining us now is Secretary of Veterans Affairs, David Shulkin. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Glad to be here. The Senate unanimously confirmed you 100 to 0. And this week, President Trump tweeted that you are making great progress and won't rest until the care of our veterans is taken care of. Is he setting expectations too high? Well, I think that's the job of the president to set high expectations, particularly about issues like caring for veterans that he feels so deeply about. And we have a lot of work to do. We're dealing with decades of problems that have existed in, in the veterans affairs, and it's going to take us a while to get this department straightened out. Just last month, you released your end-of-year statement talking about the accomplishments that you've made. And I'm curious about this one line where you say that you have ensured that vets get same-day access to primary and mental health facilities at all of our care facilities. Yet if you go to Google News, every day you will find stories about vets not being able to get same-day access. What's the discrepancy? Well, what we have assured is that if a veteran has an urgent care need, that if there's a problem that would result in harm to a veteran by waiting, that they should not be waiting, that they can come right to any of our VA facilities in our primary care or mental health areas, and they will get their problems taken care of that day, and that's our commitment to them. Some of our elective services, while waiting for routine physical exams or a screening colonoscopy may take longer than we want. We're focused right now to make sure that veterans aren't harmed by being by weight. Sure. The other thing, though, that you're seeing is that veterans still are dying, and there's a lot of reports in the news media. They're dying waiting for care. How are you addressing that issue? Well, we don't believe that veterans are dying waiting for care. This was a situation that was back in April 2014 that was a national crisis and unacceptable and certainly my top commitment to make sure that there aren't veterans that are being harmed by weights. That's why we've established these same day services that are available. Uh, if veterans aren't able to get that care, then we send them out into the private sector. You say that veterans' trust scores in this end of your letter mm -hmm. rose from 46 percent in 2014 to 70 percent. Mm -hmm. and that that seems like a, a huge jump in the time um, mm -hmm. that of this national since this national crisis. The New York Times just reported that a veterans hospital in Oregon is attempting to limit the number of patients it admits to improve its quality of care rating. And USA Today is reporting that the VA is hiring doctors with revoked medical licenses. How can the veterans trust the care that they are getting at the VA facilities? There's no doubt that in the crisis in 2014, the wait time crisis, that we lost the trust of veterans and many Americans in the public as well. The reason I'm here is because I care deeply about our military and our veterans. I come from a family of service. My 
uh, whole family has been in the service and uh, this is something that's very important to me and one of the regrets I have having spent so much time in medical training is, is that I didn't have time to go in and to serve. So this is my opportunity to give back. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank we you. We really appreciate your time. Secretary of the Department of Veterans Affairs, David Shulkin. Thank you. Great. We will have more with Dr. Shulkin tomorrow on EWTN News Nightly, including we're going to drill down into veteran suicide and the importance of pastoral care in the VA. The White House and Senate Republicans meet to seek a solution to the immigration debate. Democrats are demanding they protect DREAMers, the undocumented immigrants who were brought to the U.S. as children. White House correspondent Mark Irons tells us about today's high-profile meetings in the West Wing. Good evening, Mark. Good evening, Lauren. President Trump has made it clear he wants a strong border wall in exchange for any deal on the Dreamers. He considers immigration reform a pillar of his national security strategy, and today he invited Senate Republicans to join him for a strategy session. It really has been a very collaborative effort. Republicans need bipartisan support to pass immigration reform, which forces them to explore a deal with Democrats. President Trump seems willing to protect DREAMers in exchange for more money to build his border wall. We really are at a point where I think we could do something spectacular for the people on the border, people coming through. But it's a tough sell. Months have passed without an agreement, and DREAMers don't like being used as political pawns. Congress must pass a DREAM Act now. The U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops supports the DREAMers, asking Congress to find a solution so that immigrants aren't kicked out of the country. For the bishops, it's not a matter of, of what this looks like, whether it's a standalone bill or attached to something. It's a matter of ensuring that these individuals don't face family separation. President said, uh, Mercedes Schlapp is one of President Trump's senior advisors and a practicing Catholic. I recently questioned her about President Trump's position on immigration. He's about being compassionate. At the same time, we need to ensure we, that we have an immigration system that works, and that will require border security and interior enforcement. This debate will continue, and the stakes are high. Congress faces a January 19th deadline to avoid a federal government shutdown. And without a deal on DREAMers, Democrats might not support a new spending agreement. Lauren. White House correspondent Mark Irons, thank you. President Trump disbands his voter fraud commission amid lawsuits and the refusal of more than a dozen states to cooperate. The president says on Twitter, the states in question tend to vote for Democrats and may be covering up illegal votes. But critics saw the commission as a way to make it harder for poor people to access the ballot box. It has been 20 years in the making, and tonight... A new policy allows churches and synagogues to apply for federal aid after natural disasters. Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvi tells us about the Federal Emergency Management Agency's course correction. Good evening, Jason. Good evening, Lauren. Texas Senator Ted Cruz says he's glad FEMA backed away from what he calls a previously misguided and discriminatory policy. FEMA's change will help congregations hit by recent hurricanes, Harvey and Irma. It's all pouring out. Hurricanes Harvey and Irma damaged churches like this Catholic parish outside Houston, Texas, which News Nightly visited in August. This nearby Protestant community opened up its doors to serve the victims, even as Harvey damaged their own space. And the water came all the way to the very top of the, of the carpet right here. But these churches did not qualify for FEMA aid. Back at fights for religious liberty for all, the law firm's Diana Verm represents several churches and synagogues okay. suing FEMA. After Hurricane Harvey, FEMA was enforcing a policy that was discriminatory because it did not allow churches to receive grants for disaster relief that were available to other charitable organizations. President Trump in September weighed in, tweeting, churches in Texas should be entitled to reimbursement from FEMA relief funds for helping victims of Hurricane Harvey, just like others. This week, almost six months after the hurricane damage, FEMA finally agreed. Churches can receive disaster help. Texas and Florida are both facing long recovery processes after, after their hurricanes, and this news uh, will uh, make that recovery process a lot easier for some of the churches and 
synagogues that were at the forefront of the recovery efforts. The Supreme Knight of the Knights of Columbus applauds the decision, saying help from both the government and the nonprofit sector in the restoring of churches and other spaces dedicated to religious activities will send an important signal that these communities are coming back. The Knights gave $1.4 million to help repair or rebuild churches. The House before Christmas approved $81 billion for federal disaster aid. And Lauren, Americans United for Separation of Church and State is not happy with FEMA's change. They say the Constitution bans federal funds from building houses of worship. They say that's exactly what's going to happen with FEMA's new policy. Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvi. Thank you, Jason. The winner of House District 94 is David Yancey. Breaking a tie, the winning name is drawn from a bowl, announcing Republican David Yancey's re-election in Virginia's hotly contested House race. The race between Yancey and Democrat Shelley Simons in the 94th District last November was tied. It means the GOP will retain control of the House, 51 to 49. East Coasters are bracing for what weathercasters are calling a bomb cyclone. It brings freezing rain, sleet, snow, and hurricane force winds. More than 60 million Americans are facing the threat of severe weather. It snowed in Tallahassee. That's its first measurable snowfall since 1989, nearly 30 years ago. Every East Coast state from Maine to Florida is under some type of winter watch or warning. This is my favorite statistic. By the end of this week at Mount Washington Observatory in New Hampshire, it is expected to be minus 35 degrees. And that's a lot colder than Mars, which is at 11 degrees negative. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe says his country will do its utmost while working with the U.S. and South Korea to put added pressure on North Korea to end its nuclear program. Abe told reporters today North Korea should change policies to enrich the country, calling its people diligent. Thousands of pro-government demonstrators take to the streets in Iran as they continue to show their solidarity with the regime. Protests have shaken the country after one week of unrest. More than 20 people are dead. A girl seized during a mass abduction from a boarding school in Chibuk nearly four years ago has been found. The Nigerian government confirms that the girl was on a list of those still in captivity. More than 100 girls remain held by the Boko Haram Islamic extremist group. Pope Francis offers prayers for the 51 people who died in a massive bus accident in Peru earlier this week. The Pope says in a telegram he was deeply saddened to learn about the accident on a part of the road called Devil's Curve. He adds he's praying for the eternal repose of the deceased. The Holy Father is scheduled to visit Peru later this month. And the Pope challenges Scuderino and... They comply. An Italian scooter company is responding, has responded to Pope Francis's call to protect the environment. Scooterino is the first ever scooter ride sharing platform in Europe. It was one of nine companies to receive a $100,000 award from the Vatican's Initiative on Climate Change. The award is named for the Pope's Laudato Si encyclical. Marco Elzer is an American businessman and investor in Scuderino, which has provided thousands of rides through its app. He joins us now from Rome. Welcome to the program. Thank you, Lauren. Happy New Year and happy Epiphany to all of your viewers. A few days early, yes, indeed. Marco, Scuderino matches scooter drivers with people wanting to hitch a ride in the city in Rome that is notorious for terrible traffic. Why did you think the Vatican would pick your company to win the prize? Well, um, Scuterino was one of nine companies that won the Laudato Si uh, challenge. And I think it's because of, uh, one, it's a Rome-based um, application, and it is a very social and eco-friendly application. The objective of Scuterino really is to take traffic away from roads. Scuterino's idea is literally to try to Uberize moped transportation. Moped is by far and away, Lauren, the most effective way to come to Rome. In fact, tonight to come to your uh, spectacular terrace where I am right now, 
I came with my moped. I and have a moped. I, I have a scooter here in the minutes. United States, so I am 100% in agreement with you. You know, this is not your first interaction with the Catholic Church, is it? Uh, Scuderino Amen was started la in last year, I believe, to help bring pilgrims to priests. Tell us about that. So uh, the inventors of Scuderino thought because of the jubilee, the special jubilee of last year, to promote driving of, of her scooters for people who tend not to be very, very well off, i.e. priests and nuns. What we did is we launched a campaign giving anybody who wore a frock the opportunity to get rides for free. And we launched this campaign. Um, I think in retrospect we should have spent a bit more money launching it. We would have had a lot more success. But those priests and bishops and in fact a cardinal took these rides and were enthusiastic about it. So enthusiastic that that's how we got involved in the Laudato Si Challenge. Sure. Well, that's, um, is, is Scuderino Amen still going on? Absolutely. Anybody who's a priest who signs up or a nun is welcome to have, I don't know how many rides, three or four or five rides for free anywhere in Rome. The whole concept of Scuderino is you can zigzag through the traffic very safely because the drivers and the passengers both get rated by each other to make sure that the driver's safe and the passenger is a, is, a, is a good passenger because if a passenger is leaning out all the time or talking on the telephone or doing crazy things, he's going to get less than five stars. And if he gets below four stars, he gets booted off the, uh, the whole circuit. It's very similar to Uber. So it's, again, everything me, towards security. Marco Elzer, investor of Scuderino. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Coming up, supermarket. The Dow Jones hits a milestone. And winter of discontent. We'll talk about President Trump's very public feud with his former chief strategist. A new milestone for Wall Street. The Dow closed above 25,000 points for the first time ever. It comes around a month after the market hit 24,000. Stocks have jumped 36% since President Trump's election, November 2016. And the Trump administration is accusing Pakistan of severe violations of religious freedom. The State Department's countries of particular concern are Burma, China, Eritrea, Iran, North Korea, Sudan, Saudi Arabia, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan. Those countries are all the same ones as last year. But Pakistan this year is in its own special category on a watch list. A lawyer for Donald Trump sends a cease and desist letter to one of the president's former chief strategists. Steve Bannon, the head of Breitbart News, is quoted in excerpts from a new book making disparaging remarks about President Trump and his family, including his son, Don Jr. The publication has left the president, quote, furious and disgusted. Washington journalist Jared Rizzi joins us. Welcome back to the program. Thank you, Lauren. Good to be T with you. Today's White House briefing, Sarah Sanders tried to switch the conversation in the briefing room away from Steve Bannon and this book to the president's message. You see him here on a screen in the briefing room about how great the economy is doing. You covered the Trump White House from day one when Steve Bannon did wield influence in trying his best to use his populist philosophy to influence policy. Does any of this surprise you? No, but it is surprising that the administration is still using this everybody we don't like is the coffee boy mentality to describe people with whom they don't dis with whom they don't agree. The other part of this is the book publisher just announced that in response to the president's attorneys cease and desist, they are now moving up the publication not next week, tomorrow. Tomorrow. So they will be having this book out and the president will have to deal with the impact and all of the repercussions of that regardless of what his attorneys might be trying to do. What do you think the impact of this feud is going to have, not only on policy, but on politics? Steve Bannon has been backing people who are running for office, and he is also now trying um, to do whatever he can to take down the president, it seems. And without Bannon, 
What happens to issues also like immigration and DACA that are seen as much more centrist policies? Well, the president seems to be moving forward on the DACA issue regardless of Bannon's involvement or lack of involvement. It does seem like there are some pliabilities there, some, some malleabilities there. But regardless of Bannon, because Bannon is a media figure, someone who's got his own backing and his own group behind him, the president's supporters remain his. And that is the emphasis. There may not be any Trumpism without Trump. More importantly, the president and Bannon are both taking this very seriously from a let's protect our own hides. Everything in this book that's damaging to either of them seems to be coming out, and that is bad for everyone involved. What happens, I think, here is with this book, regardless of what happens with policy, and there are a number of issues that this could impact. The politics of this are pretty clear. The investigation, the Russia probe is not going away. This book is going to exacerbate a lot of tensions, and it's going to make it more difficult for the president to make threats to Congress, to other countries around the world. Why? Be because if his cease and desist letter is meaningless, if his threats on Bannon are meaningless, if him trying I to don't know put if I can, I don't any of these... I don't think you can these... connect those dots, that, that you're saying that a cease and desist letter is not the same is the same as not, as telling North Korea to put down the nukes? The president is trying to say, and his attorneys are trying to say, that the non-disclosure agreement is somehow binding on Steve Bannon. The White House wants to have this both ways. Either this is a betrayal of confidence or it's not true. Those statements can't individually be both. And this goes to the president's credibility, his competence in regular day-to-day -day job. I think that affects every single thing he tries to do. And I think that Trump supporters would entirely disagree with any of those premises because he's the president and what he does, um, whether or not Steve Bannon pays attention to this cease and desist order, uh, is okay with them. Sure, but if we're talking about this from the perspective of the latest feud, and, and that is, the utility of that word may be very limited here, the president likes to pick these fights when he's in a corner. The, what I'm saying is he's going to continue to be in a corner because the problems that are talked about by Bannon and by this book are not going anywhere. All right, thank you so much, Washington journal ja journalist Jared Rizzi. Thank you, Lauren. Up next, government help, Planned Parenthood's largest source of income revealed. And that's not sweet. Scientists warn a favorite treat faces an uncertain future. Today we honor the first native-born American saint. Elizabeth Ann Seton was born two years before the American Revolution in New York. The Catholic convert founded the Sisters of Charity. Her body is enshrined at the Sisters' mother house in Maryland. A Catholic deacon in the UK is awarded the British Empire Medal for his work serving seafarers and rescuing trafficking victims over the last eight years. Deacon Roger Stone helped nine fishermen and three Filipino men living on a boat in slave-like conditions. He's a port chaplain with the Catholic charity Apostleship of the Sea. To read more about this award and other news of the day, visit our partners at catholicnewsagency.com. Planned Parenthood performed more than 300,000 abortions last year, and it received more than 500,000, 500 million dollars from the U.S. government, which is the company's largest source of income. The company's excess revenue increased from last year from 77.5 million to 98.5 million, despite seeing fewer patients. Planned Parenthood's taxpayer funding has increased by 61 percent in the past 11 years. From nearly $337 million in 2006 to more than half a billion dollars this past year. In the report, CEO Cecile Richards says the company is under, quote, a historic threat. Tonight's EWTN Pro-Life Weekly features a 24-year-old who recently completed an almost 3,000-mile run and biking trek to raise awareness for the pro-life movement. With the running and biking portion, it allowed me to be able to show people my dedication to the movement. I'm willing to spend over a year of my life running um, and exerting a lot physically and biking um, and for the same reason, to tell people this is important to me. Host Katherine Zeltner talks to Anna Hadesky about her organization, Project If Life. 
You can see it tonight at 10 p.m. Eastern on EWTN. Pro-Life Weekly re-airs Sunday mornings at 10. And finally tonight, a world without chocolate. Scientists say it could become a reality as soon as 2050, and they are thanking climate change. Researchers predict cacao plants are likely to go extinct due to higher temperatures in rainforests. And before you start hoarding candy, help may be on the way. Candy giant Mars is teaming up with the University of California, Berkeley, to modify the DNA of the cacao plants. And that could allow those plants to survive in rising temperatures. Anyone who knows me knows I cannot do without peanut M&Ms, so they better figure this out and fast. For all of us here at EWTN News Nightly, to all of you around the world, thank you for watching. I'm Lauren Ashburn. We'll be back tomorrow with more news from a Catholic perspective. We'll leave you tonight with more video of this blockbuster snowstorm on the East Coast. From Niagara Falls to Florida, stay warm, good night, and God bless you.